Hello and welcome to the latest edition of the IRS Rail webinars. This is part one of the two part webinar series on harnessing IoT for preventing and recovering from rail incidents produced by the International Railway Summit in association with Frequentist. I'm Jules Omura, the Managing Director of Various Events, and it's my pleasure to welcome you all to this session. So at the last count, we had over 200 uh, people, 210 people uh, from uh, 54 countries registered for today. Uh, welcome to those of you attending our webinar program for the first time, and welcome back if you've joined us before. A few years ago, someone working for a large rail operator told me over dinner that his company's safety strategy was to have watertight procedures and vigorous training to make sure there is no accident. Because accidents were not supposed to happen, they hadn't thought much about what to do in the unlikely event that uh, accidents were to happen. He had just been sent to uh, an American university for a training course where he learned that after doing best they can to avoid incidents, they should still expect, in expect incidents to happen because they do happen, no matter how careful we are, and to have a strong incident management strategy. So this webinar series will look at two types of IoT that will help rail operators and infrastructure managers prepare for incidents from small but still costly service interruptions to fatal accidents. In today's part one, uh, we are going to explore sensors, how can railways prepare for incidents? And part two on the 21st of November will be on drones, how can railways promptly restore operations after an incident? So today will be about preventing incidents and being ready should incidents do occur, uh, with a specific focus on the use of sensors. And part two will debate post-incident recovery, uh, putting a spotlight on the use of drones as first responders in rail incidents. The registration for part two is already open, uh, so do visit our website irids.org to secure your place today. I'm delighted to have the support of uh, sector leaders and innovators as speakers with us today. In particular, we are delighted uh, to have the support of our sponsors, Frequentis and Rail Vision, which allows us to provide this important debate for anyone to watch for free. Frequentis is a leading global expert in safety critical communications. Uh, many of the world's key rail operators and infrastructure managers rely on Frequentis' control center communication systems uh, to provide day-to-day -day operations communications as well as incident and crisis management. Uh, so I look forward to learning about Frequentis' solutions on incident and crisis management from their domain sales manager, Christian Stimakovitz. Rail Vision is a provider of imaging sensor and AI-based technology to detect and identify obstacles on the track for up to two kilometers ahead. When an, an obstacle is detected, the system warns the driver and the control center, thereby helping rail operators avoid accidents. Rail Vision CEO Shahar Hania is with us today to help us visualize what's ahead for us in rail safety. I'm equally grateful to Frederick Enon from the International Union of Railways, UIC, and David Russo uh, from Trenitalia uh, for sharing their expertise with us today. This is an interactive session, so the audience are invited to participate proactively in the discussion. Uh, you can see there's a um, uh, on your screen there's a chat screen, chat uh, section, um, and uh, you're you're welcome to uh, provide your um, feedback, your um, um, uh, and and thoughts with attendees. Uh, um, there's a question. Q&A section, um, um, you're, um, you're encouraged to, to ask questions. If you have any questions to any of the speakers, um, do send your questions there. And Paolo, uh, uh, the moderator, will uh, select some of the questions um, and uh, he will ask the, um, uh, the speakers during the discussion um, in the second half of this webinar. Um, the audience members can also uh, vote um uh other other question other 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 um, uh, colleagues questions uh, by using the thumbs up button um so and the popular questions are more likely to be asked uh, we have uh, three polls today uh, pr uh, proposed by uh, the speakers so um this is a way of um providing your feedback um uh, to uh the questions being asked 
there are also handouts in the handout section. Um, the uh, today's presentations, uh, uh, some of today's presentations will be available there for you to uh, to download. Um, and finally, uh, we will be uh, um, asking you to complete a, a short evaluation um, at the end of the webinar. So if you um, uh, when you when, when the webinar is finished, uh, you'll be asked to to provide your feedback. Um, if you miss that, you'll also also get a, an email um, asking you to provide feedback uh, for this webinar. So this is very important uh, for us and, and uh, I'm pleased to complete that. We're tweeting live during this webinar. So if you can, you can follow us at, uh, at Rail Summit and please use the hashtag IRS Rail Webinars. You can see on your screen there. Um, if you enjoy, enjoy the debate, uh, do continue the debate on, uh, on Twitter and LinkedIn. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce you to our moderator for today, Paolo Glielnetti. As you can tell from my uh, being able to pronounce his name, just about, uh, he has moderated a number of our webinars and summit sessions. Um, uh, Paolo's wealth of uh, practical knowledge in rail digitalization makes him one of our favorite moderators to work with. Paolo is a partner at PwC Italy and uh, Global Railways and Roads leader for PwC. He's over, he has over 20 years of experience in transport planning, economics, and operation. I'm delighted to have you back with us, Paolo, for today's debate on sensors. How can railways prepare for incidents? Paolo, over to you. Thanks, Jules. It's a pleasure. Thanks again to IRS to, for inviting me to be back. And thanks to, again to Frequentis and Rail Vision to support our session today. As you mentioned, uh, railways are expected to be incident free. This is the expectation of users. This is the expectation of decision maker, but this is not possible. Nevertheless, uh, technology can help and we will see how much it can help, uh, not just to detect uh, and manage incident and accident, but also to probably to predict and prevent them. We have, of course, many challenges ahead in the railway system. A large part of the system is relatively aged. There's, there is a huge variety of assets, both vehicle and type of infrastructure. At the, same type, at the same time, traffic is increasing, especially on the most congested part of the network, the nodes. So the, 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 the possibility and the need to, to have a real-time detection of possible incident is becoming absolutely urgent. As I said, technology could help. Uh, we will see through the presentation of our speaker how much it can help with which solutions. Uh, but a lot of issues requires to be solved. Uh, technology availability is one, but also prioritization of the intervention regulatory alignment, organizational alignment, and so on and so forth. So I think we have plenty of topics to be discussed today. And because of that, I think we can enter now in the, in the, in the first phase with the first poll and then the first speakers, Jules. So this will be the first, uh, our first uh, uh yeah sorry um i had my mic uh, muted um yeah thank you paolo so um uh yes so the audience can see on your screen the first question um how should responsibilities for uh, sensor usage be split for rail incident management so the um, um audience are invited to respond from these uh, um options um I think uh, the first one is similar. So the first to one, um, okay. So the first one um, shouldn't say that. Um, so the um, uh, um, apologies for this. The first one should read. Um, in fact, it's it's. Um, um, I tell you what. Um, why don't we come back to this question um, at the end of Frederick's um, uh, uh, session? Yeah, let's do that. Yeah, let's so this is just um, 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 it's it's meant to say the um, the, um, uh, the the responsibility lies with the infrastructure manager, so solely being responsible. Um, let's let's rephrase but, it and then we'll, yeah, we will uh, we will yeah. um, rephrase that. But audience members, maybe you can sort of think about while you listen to Frederick's. Uh, um, uh, uh, presentation, um, uh, who should be responsible for um, uh, accidents, uh, for safety, 
um, is the infrastructure manager or railway undertaking uh, use um, or, or both together? So um, I do, do have a think about it uh, while, while you listen to Frederick. Um, Paolo, over to you. Yeah, so Frederick is our first speaker. He has been head of is uh, been head of operation and safety at UAC now since July 2020. Before that, he held many senior position in the race safety and operations sector for over 30 years, uh, including head of safety and rail department at CNCF, uh, similar position at Eurostar, and it was also managing uh, uh, the safety, interoperability and safety office at the French National Safety Agency. Uh, he was also working in uh, RFF, the Réseau Ferrer de France, the infrastructure manager before, and uh, as I say, uh, it also in Eurotunnel. So wide experience on, on operating an infrastructure management side. Uh, Frederick, you have the floor. Thank you, Paolo. Thank you, Jules, for this uh, very good introduction. Uh, I would like to start then my presentation in this uh, webinar on a practical case. So this is... Uh, and it's going to be uh, related with the question that was asked at the beginning with uh, the level of responsibility in terms of, uh, of safety uh, measures to be put in place via the infrastructure manager or railway undertakings. So the practical case that I'm going to describe here is related with the uh, what was called the Joint Network Secretariat urgent procedure that was uh, built up after some incidents which were related with extreme effects and the thermal overload in special case of freight operations. So the, the story is about uh, uh, freight trains uh, coming into the area of Italy. And on this picture, you can see the, the number of cases where some uh, flames and some incidents rel related with the thermal overload of the, uh, I would say, brake uh, break shoes and, uh, and uh, axles were occurring in the north of Italy in a, in a very short uh, terms, uh, within a, a maximum of six months, 23 cases were reported that uh, this situation was occurring and, of course, causing some, uh, some uh, incidents. Uh, as you can see on the, on the left top, you can see picture of a, a fire brigade uh, intervening on, the, on freight trains, sometimes with uh, transportation of dangerous goods. So in front of this situation, of course, this is the responsibility of, uh, of the uh, national safety authorities, but all the stakeholders to take measures in place. So, as we were saying, uh, uh, these uh, 20, 23 cases were uh, uh, discussed and debated in between experts. But at the end, of course, decision was made by the uh, national safety authorities that some measures have to be taken. On the railway undertaking side, because it was detected that the uh, majority of cases were related with composite brake blocks of the type uh, IB116 star, some speed restrictions had to be put in place. On the infrastructure management side, um, there was questions regarding you know, the functioning of the hot axle box detectors or the unlocked brake uh, uh, detectors, which were in place in the north of Italy. On the entity in charge of the maintenance and wagon keepers, some measures rel related with the traceability and adequacy of life cycle on the brake blocks on the vehicles on the wagons. So as a consequence, this was uh, provoking some reduction of capacity and uh, somehow some disappearance of the freight traffic and the freight traffic going to the, to the road traffic, by the way. So thanks to these uh, uh, measures put in place, and with the uh, uh, safety alert that was uh, uh, designed by the National Safety Authority in Italy, there was what is called a joint network secretariat urgent procedure and normal procedure put in place so that uh, experts are uh, meeting together in order to, as a short term, to assess and adjust the mitigation measures that I was describing before to propose and maybe replace at the European level some measures, uh, not only for Italy, but for the whole European network. And on, on the long term side, to try to define some permanent measures regarding the uh, um, uh, 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 measures to be put in place in order to avoid the reoccurrence of this, this events. And what is, uh, is interesting to note, and this is related with the webinar of today, it is that uh, on the short-term risk control measure, of course, the measures were looking at avoiding fixed breaks. So it was mainly 
uh, addressing the uh, operational and uh, train operating companies to adapt their processes in order to avoid the, uh, the maximum this fixed break situation. But on the uh, uh, resilience of the system and the approach of the infrastructure manager, there was as well there are as well some measures which are related to the detections of this fixed break situation. And on the uh, number two to four that you can see here, an action was to be uh, uh, addressing the detection and the consequences of the fixed breaks by the indicators on the break blocks. And this is, this is the heart of the uh, 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 practical case that I want to show here, is that thanks to these uh, studies that were performed in between all the uh, uh, experts around the table and all the data and all the root causes that were highlighted, and the benchmarking and the sharing of experience coming from the, the north of Europe and some countries. Decision was made that on the infrastructure manager side, as a short term measure, the uh, uh, thresholds levels that were equipping the uh, detectors for break blocked situations had to be modified in order to lower the threshold and the level of threshold alarms with two level of alarms one first alarm at 300 degrees and the hot alarm between 300 and 500 degrees. That was different from the previous situation, which was not allowing for having this detection of break block situations when trains were running and coming into the north of Italy. So this is, this is the, uh, the, the, the heart of the, of the uh, presentation that I'm making today is that Thanks to these short-term measures, we are now looking for putting in place some permanent measures. And in the frame of this normal procedure, which is looking for permanent measures to be put in place, we are looking for a set of actions. And one of these is here uh, described as a number 10, the possible harmonization of requirements for hot axle box and hot wheel detection system or whatever else which is allowing for having these detections processes in place so that on a permanent uh, uh, measures, we get fixed uh, uh, processes that are coping to this, uh, to this uh, requirement. And what can be learned from this practical case is that today the uh, actions are ongoing in the frame of this normal procedure of the Joint Network Secretariat to try to harmonize the operational procedures to be uh, to, to, to become a, a, a primary target operational harmonized common procedure in in the whole European railway network. So this is the first step to be to be achieved is to get this harmonization of operational processes and by the way in parallel of course uh, the, the level of responsibility in between stakeholders is of course to be to be to, to remain the same but the fact is that the, the, the new operational procedure that has to be harmonized must reflect you know, the complete view of the system interactions at all times. And this is, this is uh, uh, explained by the fact that thanks to these uh, changes of thresholds of the level of alarms, there, there is some uh, uh, lack of harmonization or approach within the uh, uh, European infrastructure manager set so that we have to work on this approach to have an harmonization process. And this is the reason why, since this GNS normal procedure is, is ongoing, UIC is looking for developing a methodology that is taking into account all the techniques, the technologies, and the, the type of sensors and the facilities which are existing or which are going to come into the railway network. So that this is included through a systemic approach so that somehow a kind of uh, a, a generic methodology for the infrastructure manager will be the basement for designing the strategies and the, post, the policies for making and performing the network surveillance and monitoring of the assets on the railway network so that it uh, carries on to provide the best services for the, for the freight and for the transportation activities. So this is, this is uh, an ongoing uh, uh, project for UIC to lead this kind of study related with the generic approach for designing the policies and the strategy for network surveillance and monitoring through, the, through these key points, meaning that uh, we need to keep at all times a systemic approach for any uh, level or type of investments. 
Safety is more and more based on the resilience of the system because it is a matter of fact uh, that uh, uh, infrastructure manager must keep running as much as possible even during degraded or crisis situation. And on the bottom of that, the harmonization of operational processes is, is really the key for making sure that interfaces and uh, interaction in between all stakeholders are kept online. So this is, this is the conclusion of my intervention to say that uh, this is a practical case which is showing that uh, whatever is going in front of us with the innovations coming to the railway, we must keep this systemic approach at all times. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Thanks a lot, Frederick. Uh, all was perfectly on time. Jules, would you like to recover now the previous poll? Yes, um, I think we're ready for that. Let's um, let's show the, um, uh, uh, the 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 original poll, um, please. Can we show the poll, please? Thank you. Um, so the question, um, this is fixed now, I think, hopefully. Um, the question is, how should responsibilities for sensor usage be split for rail incident management? Um, is it um, inf the infrastructure manager uh, being so solely responsible um, relying on their own set of sensors? Or should it be um, IMs and uh, railway undertakings together with necessary uh, governance and agreed interactions and sensors? Um, or um, it should the, the responsibilities uh, should lie with the uh, RUs, ra railway undertakings or railway operators, um, because they can operate the sensors and, and it's also actually for the benefit of, of uh, the infrastructure managers. And if you can respond to uh, this uh, question um, uh, uh, and um, uh, do... Um, I think there is a clear yes. trend. Yes, there's a, there's a trend. Um, if you can uh, try to complete the response in the next uh, 10 seconds or so, and then we will close that and then we will show the result. I think there's a clear trend uh, appearing. Um, let's uh, it, um, maybe three more seconds and then we'll close the poll. Yes, uh, let's close the poll, please. And then um, audience members and, and, and everyone can go to the uh, polls section of, of your screen. Um, and if you look under closed, uh, you will see the result. Um, okay, we will. Paolo Frederick, it. perhaps, yeah, you could comment on that. Frederick, uh, you have seen a strong preference uh, of the joint responsibility. Would you like to react on that? That's perfectly the, uh, the aim of this question, to see that if everybody is, is still maintaining the systemic approach, knowing that uh, the, uh, the, the safety is mainly in the interfaces. So that's, that's I would say, uh, confirming to me that we are all going on the right direction. <laughs> Perfect. Thanks a lot. So now, before introducing the second speaker, we have another poll. Yes. Um, let's uh, show the um, next poll, please. So, um, how do you handle disruptions? So, this is a multiple um, answer question. So, you can respond to uh, any number of uh, uh, options. Um, so, should it be paperwork and operational communication, uh, some more manual approach, or should it be IT tool? Uh, for documentation purposes only, so that, uh, that there's a record um, uh, being kept, or uh, an integrated incident management system. Um, or if, uh, would there be other options um, that we should consider, or, um, or you're not familiar with the uh, um, uh, with this uh, um, area? Um, so if you can respond to this um, uh, question, please, uh, and then maybe Paolo, you can introduce the next speaker while we wait. Yeah, meanwhile, we can introduce Christian, who is now Domain Sales Manager in Frequentis Group. Uh, Frequentis Group has been providing safety critical, critical communication and information solution for more than 75 years. So Christian is younger than that, is younger than Frequentis, of course. <laughs> This includes uh, industry-leading railway and urban transport project uh, in more than 25 countries all over the world. And Christian's specific experience includes 14 years of domain expertise in, in the topic of today, the incident management, 
across public safety and public transport. It's currently responsible for one of the key products of Frequentis, which is the incident and crisis solution that will be introduced by Christian right now. We have the result of the poll as well. I think we can, you can uh, uh, briefly react on that uh, before, uh, before going to the presentation. I see that uh, the majority uh, is in favor of an integrated incident management system, but there are also uh, some this a significant number that were not uh, able to answer or uh, suggesting that just paperwork, paperwork and operational communication can work with IT use for documentation only. So a bit more variety of answer than in, in the previous poll, Christian. You have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Paul, and thanks for this uh, uh, very kind uh, introduction. Just a quick reaction on the poll. Uh, um, yes, it shows also my experience in discussion uh, with customers, and I'm happy to see that the trend goes to integrated uh, uh, to an integrated incident uh, uh, management. Yeah, I'm happy to talk about uh, an incident management in the age of uh, digitization in the next couple of minutes. This is what we're talking about. Uh, we are, as Paul said, the specialist for communication and information solutions for safety critical uh, control uh, centers. And this in and this uh, uh, within uh, the five business fields you can see in the bottom left uh, corner. It's in the civil air traffic management, uh, defense, public safety, public transport, and maritime. We do have a, a strong network uh, around the world and are on a continuous growth path. We are a global specialist driven by know-how, experience and synergies. It's important uh, uh, to us uh, to invest in research as an R&D research and development and leveraging uh, cross industry heritage in product uh, uh, development. Uh, yeah, a couple of numbers on, on the left hand side. Yeah, pointing out uh, public transport uh, of the business units. Uh, this slide points out the products and solution you can see on the right uh, hand side. And today I'm uh, uh, focusing on, as a public transport, we're focusing on heavy rail and urban rail. And uh, today uh, in this session uh, and from now on, I'm focusing on incident and crisis management. And in short, uh, we call it uh, ICM. The business requirements for an incident management are really comprehensive. A system needs to cover infrastructure, operational on the left side, security occurrences, and uh, last but not least on the right uh, uh, bottom side, yeah, really occurrences up to crisis uh, uh, scenarios. So there are a lot of use cases and customer needs uh, uh, that has to be covered. And at this stage of digitization, uh, we are as a uh, very techn technology change is very likely and uh, driven by terms like higher efficiency uh, in railway operations, as well as also automated uh, train operations. Therefore, a system must be able to support organizational and technical change management programs at the customer. Uh, this saves uh, uh, the investment uh, for our uh, customers. On the next slide, uh, this is uh, yeah, what we call it, uh, Frequentis Safety Ecosystem, and shows the building blocks uh, when we are talking about uh, ICM. We are aware of, uh, and in my mind, it's obvious that everybody is doing a kind of uh, incident and safety management. And, also and I also experienced uh, that there is always a kind of uh, improvement uh, uh, possible. That's why we also have this uh, uh, webinar uh, uh, today. ICM is designed to renew legacy systems and consolidate it, consolidate it into one system. Maybe that sounds uh, yeah, obvious, uh, but it uh, uh, does not have to happen uh, all at once. Very important uh, for us and as well uh, for our customers. The harmonization timeline is at our customers. As an example, you can start seamlessly on the left upper side, live interfaces, 
uh, yeah, integrate uh, uh, a sensor or a specific type of a sensor and covering one or more uh, use cases or really one specific uh, use cases. And then you can gain experience uh, and extend uh, the use cases. And this is how our solution yeah, seamlessly integrates uh, uh, from, from a starting uh, point at the customer uh, environment. Yeah, here we are at the sensors uh, and how to deal uh, with sensors. Uh, with the notification management capabilities, we are able to deal uh, uh, with sensors. Uh, it structures uh, the mass of sensor data in real time and with business rules, you can see this business intelligence uh, BI yeah, symbol in the middle of, you can create thresholds, uh, pattern recognition and bring sensor data in a specific operational uh, use case. So meaning uh, a background service is supporting you uh, as an operator in the control room or a background service is supporting you uh, monitoring the thresholds uh, and informing uh, the safety manager or infrastructure uh, manager. Uh, yeah, and this either to capture data for uh, root cause analysis, incident resolution, or to support uh, uh, to avoid a serious occurrence, safety uh, use case. And last but not least, to create heat maps or report historical sensor data of an asset to plane maintenance. We heard about this, uh, yeah, uh, breaking uh, systems, uh, yeah, and also these use cases can be incorporated and semi-automated, or automated, uh, and processed by our system. This slide shows, um, yeah, a typical or a life cycle of an incident, as well as the sensor uh, icon uh, on the steps here identify. Uh, and uh, the step two, four, and seven, where the live sensor data can really main contribute. Uh, and uh, uh, this contribution is to save time in identifying incidents as well as handling uh, the incidents. And in case of emergency where seconds counts and the operator is in a stressful situation, it's the challenge of an incident management to guide the operator really through this uh, resolution process uh, with procedures. Uh, and this uh, uh, in a matter of without over overhaul him to deal with the system uh, itself. So it must be really easy to use and really pointed uh, and uh, the information the operator can see are really tailored uh, and exact for, for uh, his action uh, to be done. And each functionality, you can see it in the three uh, green pillars, each functionality of ICM, uh, you can tie into one of the three pillars. It's about uh, yeah, decision, documentation, and uh, communication support. Examples, uh, gateways and interfaces, integration uh, topics. So on this slide, it shows how many information in case of an incident resolution must be handled uh, by an operator, or by the persons uh, uh, in the field. And it's always a collaboration uh, 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 challenge. Uh, and therefore, integration is key for an efficient uh, incident uh, resolution. Available data can prefill forms uh, to avoid uh, typos, save time, and create a single source of truth for any kind uh, of disruptions. Doing that with supplementary information from sensor notification or from train lists, dangerous goods information. I can imagine a uh, fire brigade would be happy to know, uh, yeah, which dangerous goods are uh, on the on the cargo uh, tra uh, train uh, yeah, when they're approaching uh, an incident uh, location. And last but not least, information distribution to collaborate, to inform the rail operators, to inform public authorities, uh, uh, and also to inform uh, passengers. Observation as well. Uh, uh, as well as to contribute during incident resolution is supported via mobile usage uh, and the field forces uh, on smartphones, tablets, or specific uh, devices. On, slide, on this slide, uh, I do have an, an example. It's uh, about the monitoring uh, level crossing. 
call it uh, call it an idea, call it uh, a proof of concept. Um, uh, sometimes it's existing in the field uh, at the pilot project, but it uh, uh, shows uh, uh, a safety use case uh, handled uh, uh, by SCN. It has to be understood as an additional mechanism to level crossings equipment in place. It just brings sensor data from CCTV with special algorithms at the level, as CCTV at the level crossing with a back-end service uh, special algorithm on that and the train position in the interoperational context, utilizing the business intelligence uh, function of ICM. And the train position could as well be a real position or could be a simulated uh, position if the uh, incident management systems is uh, well integrated uh, into existing uh, system. And um, yeah, therefore it... Uh, contributes uh, to uh, a safety uh, use case. And on my last slide, uh, I want to be uh, yeah, give an outlook uh, for the next seminar, uh, for the next webinar. It's about uh, how to deal uh, uh, with drones. And uh, this slide shows what needs to be done in case of incident uh, handling uh, or in case of handling drones in case of an incident or in case of uh, yeah, plant maintenance, as an example. Who is handling this at the railway company and for which purposes drones are used? But more in the next webinar on this side. Yeah, my at the end of the presentation and then over back to Paolo. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Christian, to introduce uh, such comprehensive solution. And now we will move to another poll, Jules. Um, I believe um, there's no poll in this uh, segment. Okay, yeah. okay, correct. Yes, sorry. So David uh, is our next speaker. David Russo, uh, head of electric, electronic, and communication engineering in Train Italia, with experience in train signaling system, train control and management system, as well as electric engine traction control, converters, batteries and board to ground telecommunication system, wire and wire networking, area MS analysis and risk assessment. Uh, so a, a wide range of expertise and also very important experience as a train operator. Uh, so bringing another, another view on, on this interesting topic. David, you have the floor. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Paolo, for the, your uh, introduction. No, sorry, just so, one second. I have to. I would like to remind to everybody to ask for questions in the Q and A part of our uh, platform uh, because they will be used for our panel session afterwards. Sorry again. Okay, and uh, I'll try to share the screen with my presentation. So here, let me. See. Uh, do you see it? Yes, yes I, we can see your screen. Okay. So uh, thank you for uh, your introduction. Uh, my name is David Russo. Uh, as uh, said Paolo, uh, I work in Trentalia. I'm in charge of the electric and electronic engineering of rolling stock. And uh, in the, the few minutes I, I have, I'll try to give you a summary about the main sensor types installed on our trains, especially the ones that are related to safety function. And I I'll show you a case study of uh, the application of a new Excel box temperature control over an existing fleet. So next slide. Okay. Uh, you know, rolling stocks, uh, especially the newest one, are uh, very, very complex systems. Uh, and inside them, uh, the, there are many different devices that can operate together thanks to the, all the information coming from uh, really a lot of different sensors in the train. Depending on the subsystem, uh, the function of this sensor can be or not relevant for safety. And uh, when uh, I speak about safety, I mean safety in controlling the movement of the train, safety of the passenger and the staff on board, and also safety in the maintenance operation. 
And, uh, you know, sometimes uh, the role of this sensor can be really, really critical. In this slide, uh, I try to give you an idea on how different kind of sensors are related to train subsystems and when uh, these sensors are relevant for safety. Uh, this is a, a, a very simple schematization. Uh, the, the train architecture are uh, much more complex. Anyway, uh, for example, the pressure sensors are commonly used in brakes, in doors, in uh, pneumatic suspension and pantograph. And uh, you know, the doors and especially the brakes are really critical for safety of the passenger and train movements. Voltage and current uh, transducers are uh, used almost uh, on every electrical subsystem and become uh, relevant for safety when you deal with the high voltages protections. Also, accelerometers are widely used in controlling different devices, including the, uh, the motors. But uh, uh, if we ask where are installed the most critical sensors, I think there's a simple answer to this question. The more you go close to the track side, the more the safety aspects are relevant. And here, close to the, the, the track side, you find the axle boxes in which are typically integrated two different kinds of sensors. The odometry sensors used typically by signaling to calculate speed and space information and the temperature sensor that are used to control the temperature and integrity of the axle bearings. So talking about the uh, hot box detection, uh, usually all the new high speed trains uh, include their own control system. And uh, for our fleet, this is the case of ETR 500, uh, which uses NTC sensor. ETR 600 and ETR 700 uh, with the PT 1000 sensors and the ETR 1000 with the PT 1000 sensor plus safety thermal fuses. On older fleets, uh, this control system usually are not installed. And this is the particular case of our ETR 485 fleet. So, on the ETR-485 fleet, uh, we had to find a technical solution to install a hot box detector with uh, the following constraints. Ensure a high safety level, reuse uh, the existing spare cabling on the train, and avoid any modification of the axle box. And in detail, uh, there were available only a spare wire cape couple plus shield coming from next to each axle box to the inside of each rolling stock. So we defined a solution divided into two separate independent sections. The first section, based on 10,000 kilo, uh, uh, 10 kilo ohm NT, uh, NTC, uh, was read by a microcontroller unit, and the second section, based on thermofuses and redundant safety relays, was able to direct trigger alarm. In uh, normal working condition, uh, as the temperature increases, and here I try to start. Uh, uh, as the temperature increases of a, a first threshold, uh, the microcontroller triggers a yellow alarm in the driver cab, which gives the indication to reduce the speed. If the temperature increases over a second higher threshold, the controller triggers a red alarm, which gives indication to the driver to stop the train. In case of failure of the microcontroller system, uh, if the temperature overcomes a higher threshold on the axle box, the correspondent fuses burns and it directly triggers the red alarm and stops the train. 
To do so, uh, we developed a composite sensor that integrates uh, on the, the three wires I told before, so the two wires plus the shield, an anti-C resistor, a thermal fuse, and also a Zener diode that is used by the controller to check uh, at every power up the wiring impedance. The sensor has built into one of the Excel box covering bolt uh, because uh, this bolt uh, in the Excel box uh, in the deeper point comes very, very close to the upper part of the bearing. Uh, uh, that is the part uh, with the higher heating. Uh, and during the last summer, we equipped uh, uh, two coaches of two different trains uh, uh, with uh, this prototype uh, you see in the picture. And uh, they were used during commercial services in order to test and validate uh, both the sensor and the, and the system. Uh, the availability and the safety of the project uh, has been also checked by an independent assessor, uh, which evaluated the system as compatible with the SIL4 requirements. And uh, today we are starting the industrial production phase to install the, the system on, uh, on the fleets. Obviously, uh, all the controller uh, uh, the controller records all the relevant information coming from the sensor temperature, the integrity of the fuses, uh, uh, the, the status of the relay, the commands from the MMI, errors, and so on. All these data are uh, sent uh, through the uh, onboard Ethernet to the onboard train diagnostic, and from the onboard train diagnostic are sent to our ground servers in order to do improvements and also to uh, develop a predictive analysis. And thank you very much. There is a clarification question I will ask you right now, David. What is the seal yeah. for, if you can precise me? Clear to the audience. So the the, the SIL4 uh, was uh, evaluated by uh, safety analysis, uh, considering the the, the, the worst case uh, in which uh, the the system uh, does not recognize and uh, uh, overcome the temperature over 110 degrees. Uh, that the, the threshold that uh, can break the, the fuse. Consider that uh, the, the fuse is read, is read uh, by two independent chains of uh, optocouplers and each, uh, each chain uh, uh, command a safety relay. Uh, relay. So uh, to uh, not uh, detect uh, the, the temperature, you contemporarily have to uh, have failure of the controller system with the NTC and defuse uh, and both the chain of the control that are controlling the fuse. Uh, in that way, from the starting from a failure tree analysis and FMEC analysis, the assessor has uh, uh, concluded that uh, the C4 is reachable. So that, that means, uh, say, for the ones that are not familiar, SEAL is safety integrity level, SEAL 4 is the best level yeah. of integrity. It's the best, and uh, it means if you consider a uh, hourly probability of failure, uh, when uh, in this case failure is uh, uh, a problem of the uh, increasing temperature that you are not able to detect, uh, this uh, probability is uh, uh, 1 divided uh, 10 uh, elevated to 9. Okay. okay. Thank you, David. There are some other clarification questions, but we'll put them together for our panel session uh, at the end. Thank uh, you very much. In order to move now on the, on the fourth, uh, Slot uh, starting, I think this time we have a poll. Yes, eh? indeed, we have a poll. If we can uh, um, show the poll, please. Yes, 
Yes. Um, so the question is, and um, I know autonomous future is coming, but it, it will take time to arrive. In the meantime, we can assist drive and operation managers um, uh, by offering uh, more control um, uh, to the, the, the drivers and operation managers by offering more control. What do you think is most uh, critical? Um, so uh, where uh, ADAS solutions, this is I, I believe advanced drive assistance systems, ADAS solution that will uh, help the driver, predictive maintenance solutions that will uh, that run day and night throughout the day, night, um, big data and cloud computing that auto analyzes the outgoing status of the rail, um, uh, or all of the above. The, uh, if the audience member can respond to this question, and uh, in the meantime, um, Paul, if you like to uh, uh, introduce yeah. the speaker, yeah, Shar is the the next speaker, the CEO of Rail Vision, uh, also company former vice president for research and development. He has a significant experience in the, in several industry, consumer, military, and railways, of course, in the skill and optical engineering systems engineering, electro-optics, optics algorithm, uh, and deep learning uh, and research and development, as I said. So, Shahar, just one second that we have to go to the close to the poll. Yes. Um, so, uh, if the audience members can um, if, if, make your final uh, votes, if you haven't yet, in the next maybe three seconds or so, we will close. And yes, let's close the poll, please. And the, the response is um, there in the poll section. So most of the of the, of the audience thinks that all the above, uh, all the proposed uh, uh, answers are relevant. Let's say, and uh, seventy percent of the of our audience thinks that, and uh, the rest is distributed with a slight. Uh, num a higher number for predictive maintenance solution uh, having more more votes. Are you in line with the, with that, Char? With the the the, the overall uh, opinion of our audience? Uh, Shahar, we cannot hear you. Yeah. I think there's a um, sound issue there. I think. Can you maybe call him and... Uh... Yeah, no, um, it's still not... Uh, um, um, apologies for this, this uh, technical issues with the system. Okay, we'll get uh, um, uh, we'll we'll, um, uh, we'll 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 sort out the sound system and and Paolo, maybe in the meantime, um, uh, perhaps we can sort of ask. Uh, we have some we have some questions coming in from the audience. Maybe we can sort of ask yeah. some questions to the. Uh, I will start maybe with the the question to David. Uh, they are very specific, so we can uh, complete his. Uh, explanation about the, the the presentation and then I will move uh, to the more to the general one if you agree uh, so David if you can uh, come back on uh, uh, the, uh, do you hear me yes sir. yes I can hear you so David I think yeah okay and the, now David, so that was a couple of okay. A couple of questions for, for you. One Thanks. is about the white signal. What is the white signal for? I don't remember on which slide that was. It's uh, uh, the, the yellow and the red signal. Yes, they say the white as well. Ah, okay. And, uh, uh, no, there, there's uh, there are only two levels of, of uh, information sent to the driver. But uh, this uh, is uh, the same approach uh, we have uh, on uh, other existing train. And uh, these two information are a yellow lamp and a, a red lamp. And uh, the, the yellow lamp uh, gives the driving uh, the indication to reduce the speed. 
uh, usually lower than 90 kilometers per hour. And uh, if uh, otherwise triggers the red alarm, uh, the driver has to stop immediately the, the train and uh, going down the train and check physically if there's problem on the on the axle box. The, the system we have introduced uh, uh, has also a, a display uh, with uh, a diagnostic information. Uh, so the driver before coming down can check on board the, the driver or, or uh, the other uh, train staff can check on board information. And uh, this uh, diagnostic information are made uh, both uh, in a software way uh, through the, the display, but also in a hard way through LED that checks the integrity of uh, each fuses. So also in case of fault uh, of the software part, uh, there's diagnostic information useful to the onboard staff. There's no white uh, indication. There's also another information that if the yellow lamp is blinking, it means that, that there's a, a failure of the system, but not a failure of the sensor. Okay, there was another, Jules, so whenever you would like to, to, to restart, we will... Um, Shall can, can you hear me? Yes, I, we can yeah, hear you. Okay. So, David, thanks, we will come back on you later on. Thank you very much. Okay, so, uh, first of all, uh, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, sorry for the mess with uh, the IT stuff. Uh, and I would like to thank IRS for having this platform, a uh, wonderful platform for sharing uh, all the good ideas regarding technology and sensing and so on. Uh, I'm personally involved in uh, uh, electro-optics algorithm and physics technologies since 94. Uh, I don't, and uh, I would like to share with you some of the uh, uh, things that we, uh, uh, we've developed and already running in some places. And uh, just let's start. I'll share my presentation. Can everybody see? Yes, now we can see it. Okay, great. I'll start with a short clip showing you the problem and the solution that we are talking about. Every year, there are thousands of railway accidents. In 2019, there were 1,552 accidents in Europe alone. These accidents cost the lives of 824 people. 618 more were injured. And the total damage is estimated to have cost about 3.5 billion euros. This is the moment a train driver in Poland ran down the aisle warning passengers seconds before the train crashed into a lorry. Rail Vision presents the Artificial Intelligence Revolution for Preventing Railway Accidents. The systems operate day and night under all weather conditions. They are able to sense beyond the required braking distance through a combination of sensors specially developed in the company's laboratories and artificial intelligence. With these systems, a previously unavoidable accident is transformed into a controlled braking sequence, enabling the driver to safely bring the train to a complete stop. Detection of humans and vehicles in an urban environment. Detection of vehicles at long distances. Detection in a railway operational environment. Detection of the train travel route. Detection of locomotives and rail cars. The system relies on artificial intelligence to detect, identify, and classify objects. Detection of braking shoes in a railway operational environment. Detection during limited visibility. Detection of large animals. Rail vision. Trains just got smarter. Okay, I hope uh, you managed to see uh, the clip smoothly, but uh, if, we'll can, if you can look into the problem that we have all over the world, there's endless amount of accidents takes place all over the world, everywhere, 
and lately we just saw some incidents in the U.S. that were terrible and could, with the right sensors and the right system approach and with the right operations, could be probably uh, avoid and save all the lives and the traffic jams and uh, uh, damage to the platform, to the infrastructure. So because of that, uh, we developed our system in order to, uh, first of all, uh, do a safety related system. The system is a combination of sensors, uh, visual sensors and thermal images, thermal sensors uh, that are installed on the top of the locomotive. Once we are there, we are carrying data all the time and the artificial intelligence runs in real time and provide an alert for the driver or the operator. And by that, the operator and driver can, in matter of fact, get those alarms and stop the train if needed. Because if you'll take a driver that can see, I don't know, uh, 300, 400 meters, uh, and at night he sees nothing, uh, the technology allows us to look and uh, classify up to two kilometers. And if we consider, a, a, let's say, a, a stop distance of breaking distance of around 800, one kilometer, it means that the driver or the train has enough time to respond accordingly and stop the train and by that avoid those terrible accidents. You know, uh, usually what we see in the rail, in the current uh, rail industry, we see that uh, there are wayside sensors uh, uh, up uh, in the infrastructure, uh, near the tracks and uh, whatever, whatever uh, uh, you can think of. Our revolutionary approach is not having every few meters a sensor, but having one sensor running in real time on the top of the locomotive. And by that, uh, inspecting all the way, all the route, all the time that the trains are running. And this is a great message to the industry. So, what are the problems or the challenges that we see in the train uh, industry as, of, as for today? Uh, well, we have a lack of man, manpower, uh, which causes, of course, downtime. Human fatigue, you know, a man, uh, an operator or driver inside the, the cabin. I was personally uh, so many times in the locomotive, inside the locomotive, you cannot look for eight hours, four hours, depends on on the local regulations uh, uh, and have and being uh, with your eyes on the, track, on the tracks all the time. Second uh, or third, those safety hazards, uh, if you cannot uh, identify and classify, it, the outcome is accidents. And going so on, and uh, we can conclude it with high operational cost damages, casualties, God forbid, and again, uh, uh, a bad reput reputation for the operator. So, uh, uh, I think that uh, Christian from uh, uh, Frequentis was talking about managing all the data, uh, but having a very uh, high quality data that quite a lot of analysis can be applied on, this is the most important thing to my view. Because you can have uh, uh, the, the, you know, the data from many sensors, but if you, if you have somebody or something that is out there and see for a long distance and uh, give you all the information that you need with high quality sensors, this is a real revolution. So what can you do with the data that is collected by the ADA system? Of course, improve safety, which is the very first time that we are there for, and increase efficient, increasing efficiency. Because uh, you know, uh, if you don't have accidents, and we can monitor also uh, predictive maintenance, uh, uh, maintenance issues. You know, bended poles, uh, lack of uh, uh, of ballast or whatever. All of these things can be detected with a system with this technology, and by that, of course, reduce dramatically the cost because whenever you are going from predictive from maintenance to predictive maintenance you are saving a lot of money 
So we are uh, active in the marshalling yard or switch yard uh, area and also freight and intercity uh, areas, mainline and switch, and switch yards. Uh, our system, as I mentioned before, you can see up to two kilometers. We are combining a thermal imager uh, with uh, IP optics and also uh, with wide range and uh, a narrow field, uh, narrow field of view. So we can uh, make a combination of sensors that inspect the long range and short range with curves. And by that, as I mentioned before, running artificial intelligence and, and provide uh, uh, the operator or the driver enough information and alerts in order so we can avoid those terrible accidents. This is an example of how we can use this technology in real time. Uh, this is uh, a mainline application. Uh, you can see on the left, the thermal imager. On the right, you can see the long range or the, the narrow field of view sensor. But here you can see the pathfinding run, uh, running in real time for changing the switch. The switch stage was changed. And now we are detecting uh, the train in front of us because on the uh, previous uh, uh, state, uh, this train was not relevant for the driver. Another detection that we did in the north, in the southern part of Israel, you can see here the wonderful detection with the thermal imager. And here, there is no chance in the world that uh, somebody inside the cabin will be ever close to classify this threat. And this is from Australia on the deserts. Uh, you are talking about a level crossing inspection. You have it built in. You don't need any additional sensor for that. You have with one sensor, you can take care of it all. We classify the tracks. Uh, we detect only the relevant threats. So once the driver is, you know, outside the tracks, it is irrelevant. So we don't overflow the driver with additional info information that is not relevant. Another detection from one kilometer also in the southern part of Israel, running in real time. This guy just walking there and doesn't understand the great danger that he is in. Shara is very, very interesting, but unfortunately your time is ended. So please go to the conclusion. Okay. So this is also an example of taking care of the infrastructure. This system is the switch yard. Just one example for the switch yard, again, changing the switch direction in real time. This is the installation inside the cabin. And that's it. Uh, sorry, that's it. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Char. So uh, I think very, very, very interesting and also to, to see the potential of this uh, technology. Uh, I think now we have uh, about 20 minutes to for the panel discussion. We have a number of questions uh, arrived from the audience. So I will uh, uh, consider them strictly on the basis of, uh, let's say, their uh, uh, the, the appreciation, you know, I, I remember, I would like to remind to the audience, they can vote for the question if they think they are particularly interesting, they can uh, bring one of them up. Uh, so the first one from, uh, uh, I will publish it uh, so everybody can see it, the, the one that get most votes as about most recent development made uh, with the use of sensor in railways, I think Christian and Shahar and also David provided examples and their positive impact on preventive action. So I will focus, if you agree, speakers, your answer on uh, the, the role to prevent uh, uh, incidents of uh, the technology you mentioned or discuss or in general, and depending on your perspective. So I start... Uh, uh, on the reverse order. So, Shar, would you like to start uh, about that? Yeah. Yeah. You know, the visual sensors 
from my point of view, are the most uh, advanced and most uh, giving the most information. So we can do quite a lot of that. If you, for example, see vegetation penetrates the gauge of the train, you can detect it before it hits the train and even one month ahead. So uh, all of these things can help. And uh, with preventive action, you know, providing an alert, not for the driver, but for the maintenance guys. So they can go there, you know, they have a few days to go there and take care of the problem before you have an issue. Uh, so, of course, quite a lot of use cases uh, are in discussion with the operators that we are in contact with. And the potential is just huge. Okay. okay. I'll give an there additional, uh, additional uh, uh, example. We're having uh, a thermal imager. Uh, on top of the locomotive means that you can also uh, test electric box whether they are dissipating heat or not because if they are not dissipating heat it means that it is not operational okay very interesting david uh, also has to focus on one or two examples because of course we have yes yes uh, uh, i would like to say that uh, as, a, as i told before on the train, they are already installed a lot of sensors in uh, many systems and subsystems of the train. And uh, uh, I, I think uh, one uh, of the best action we can do for uh, as a preventive uh, action is to uh, collect and use all this data. Because uh, usually today, many uh, the, of these systems are not related the one to each other. And uh, this is uh, one thing uh, we, we are just uh, doing in Trenitalia from uh, many years uh, because uh, we have uh, a black box, uh, a juridical recorder uh, that collects uh, not only the data coming from the signaling, but also the data coming from the driver's cab and from the main systems uh, on the train. And we also have now a, a, another more complex system that uh, collect uh, all this data uh, present uh, on the train bus uh, and uh, perform a predictive maintenance uh, action. But also uh, we can check uh, the behavior of the driver. And uh, also in this case, uh, we can do, we can check if uh, in uh, sometimes there's not safe uh, behavior and correct them. Okay, thanks. And Christian? Thanks for handing over, pa Paolo. Uh, I would say I'll point out uh, the data fusion cells. So we're connecting the systems uh, to each other and bringing it into an operational uh, context. And therefore, we're building a valid uh, yeah, single source of truth for safety manager, infrastructure manager, for further data analysis, analysis as well as for real-time processing uh, to avoid incidents in, in different kinds of use cases. Okay, Frederick, to close on this. Yeah, I would uh, just confirm the, what has been said before. It's, uh, it's not a matter of technology regarding the sensors, but the most, I would say, recent development is that uh, we, we are in a process of digitalization of safety management. So it means that we are interconnecting what is actually uh, available and which is maybe not optimized in, in terms of usage. And thanks to this digitalization, we go more and more uh, in preventive uh, domain than in the curative uh, domain, using the actual sets, of course. Okay. Then we have a specific question on... Uh, I'll try to put it. Uh, just one second. About level crossing. So starting from Christian, maybe since you presented that, in which countries the level crossing monitoring has already been deployed? Uh, it's a pilot project, and unfortunately, I'm, I'm not allowed to mention that. But it's in the in, in the area of the Nordics uh, where this okay. is deployed. But it's uh, also used for uh, different purposes, uh, having in mind insurance use cases. Uh, uh, I think Shahar mentioned, uh, yeah, there are a huge amount of damages in terms of oils uh, as a money, uh, which could, could be avoided. And uh, this is more or less the service uh, what brought in here. Shahar, do you have any uh, experience also on this kind of solution uh, deployment? Yeah. A level crossing uh, we saw in uh, ISO in many places, also in Israel, where, where we are located in. 
uh, many approaches, radar, lidar, and also cameras. Uh, but as I mentioned before, I know that there are some efforts in, in the U.S., uh, but they have more than 100,000 uh, location to do that. So you have to go one by one and change it uh, okay. and install it. Okay, thanks. I will move to the next one to give uh, the possibility to answer to more, uh, to more points. So there were specific for Frequentes uh, about the extension of safety sensor to new generation of freight wagons together with these brakes to replace the block brakes. If you want to answer, of course. Uh, because... Yes, of course, but I really have to read the, the, the question first. <laughs> Thanks for that. <laughs> uh, just at first, I want to point out, yeah, Frequentis is not delivering sensors, so we are connecting uh, the sensors. So in, in, in our use case, it's uh, we can utilize uh, uh, the sensors and, and bring it into the context of safety as well as for incident uh, uh, resolution management. So in our mind, if there is an old technology available or a new technology available, if we do have the interface and we, if we can gather the data in any kind of way, uh, yeah, we can bring it into, uh, let's say, uh, automated, semi-automated process for computing. Mm -hmm. I don't know what, if any other or any one of the other speakers has a view on uh, extension of this uh, safety solution to freight. Uh, to, to freight, the, the, the only thing uh, I can add is that uh, in Italy, uh, one uh, difficult in introducing sensor on, uh, on freight trains is the powering of the sensor. So the, the need is to develop a sensor uh, that can automate. Uh, take power from uh, solar cell and so on and have a very small consumption and that also the the communication on, of the information from the sensor to the driver's cab uh, with the mesh network and so on uh, that uh, is critical on long trains that's uh, yeah. only a technical uh, issue but it's an issue okay thanks a lot very useful this is for you shahar three questions in a row about uh your system well uh, thank you for the question uh, uh, for the first one uh, yes our system is uh, is operational rain hot humid whatever uh, fog is an exception uh, depends on the density of the fog you have four levels of fog so till level three or something like like that around we are uh, uh, operational and for the second part uh, we can do both. In a matter of fact, once we provide an alert, we can direct it to the driver or we can uh, 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 provide it uh, through the Ethernet uh, uh, connection to whatever control box that will be able to have this, uh, 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 this message. Uh, we, in a matter of fact, uh, did that in SBB Cargo. Uh, once the driver, if the driver will not respond to a uh, uh, to a danger in three seconds, uh, then the system just stops the train. Okay, so we did that. Okay, okay. and in the city, trams, uh, I don't think in the trams, uh, the technology, of course, is valid. Uh, but I think that the great message of rail vision is, is the distance because uh, the driver is, is uh, in opposite to a train uh, in trams, the driver is really relevant. Okay, you can see up to 50 meters. It can respond accordingly and uh, you know just uh, a, a, a car aid us would be sufficient there probably okay thanks a lot uh, another one but this is for christian but uh, i will ask also david and frederick to answer to this so whether state-owned companies are more or less confident to contract out i think incident management or they are able to manage by themselves crisis situation. I think in most cases they are obliged to manage by themselves, but uh, I would like to hear also your answer. Yes, thanks. Uh, what is my answer? Uh, my answer is a cooperation. So when, when an incident uh, turns into a crisis situation, I think it's always a collaboration effort. So there are many authorities uh, involved, uh, starting from uh, police forces, fire brigades, uh, rescue services, 
as well up to uh, the rail operator in, uh, itself or the train operating um, company uh, has to has to uh, contribute uh, for incident resolution. So you therefore you have to think with coming back to the first question: Is it a state crisis? Then uh, the the uh, well, let's point out. Uh, uh, and a, a large event, uh, then maybe it's led by uh, the municipality uh, itself. Uh, but at the end, uh, the rail, rail operator then have to contribute with their own solution. And if it's a, uh, let's say, a crisis situation in a railway organization, then the company itself can manage it. But then uh, um, there is a need for, uh, let's call it an IT solution uh, to support uh, uh, that, because it's uh, at the end, it's all about documentation. And we do not have to forget about when uh, yeah, a situation uh, is resolved, an occurrence, an incident is resolved, or a crisis situation, there are always debriefing meetings. And the safety aspect, uh, aspect is also, also to identify the learnings of it and bringing it back uh, to safety measures. Okay, Frederick. Yeah, definitely. Uh, this question is related with the fact that uh, more and more we are asking the infrastructure managers and the networks to become resilient because more and more now the safety is based on the uh, capacity to answer to external aggressions. So this kind of uh, crisis management, incident management is anyway in the, in the responsibility scope of the infrastructure manager, taking into consideration that they have to organize interaction with the external services or external, I would say, means in order to to be able to answer to this crazy situation. So it's not so much a matter of state-owned companies uh, to manage by themselves. It is really uh, the way that you are making the, the organization of crisis management in place in the frame of your uh, scope. And so it does not relate with the, the way that you are organized on the state state level. It is the way that infrastructure manager is organized with external, uh, I would say, uh, interaction. So that mm -hmm. is able to uh, deal with the crisis situations, which is one of the duty of any infrastructure manager to to deal with the crisis, crisis management. So it's a matter of, uh, of uh, I would say, uh, uh, progress plan in order to so for, in, for instance, to, to, to uh, have uh, regular uh, exercises, making, uh, you know, a, a, a play of uh, roles and, uh, and, uh, and bodies who have to deal with an uh, uh, expected situation on a crisis, crisis mode, you know. So this is, yeah. Um, okay. For David. Yeah, yes, uh, I agree. Is uh, I'm not expert in this field, but uh, anyway, uh, I know the, they are involved uh, both in the infrastructure manager, both the the uh, our company and all uh, all the other structure uh, of the government uh, for the involved in uh, in the crisis. But uh, anyway, is uh, it, it depends also on the gravity of the crisis. Uh, usually, the the rail company is uh, deal with the, the manage the passengers, uh, the help, uh, the the support, uh, manage uh, to change uh, uh, the rolling stock and so on. All the other one is a, a full cooperation with uh, all the other uh, structures. Thanks, thanks, David. We are cl uh, arriving close to the end of our meeting, so unfortunately I cannot end the more question. I will just ask to Christian if he can uh, tell us uh, in one minute what will be the next webinar about uh, linked to the same topic or a different focus. Yes, uh, yeah, today we talked about sensors uh, used at infrastructure. Uh, at uh, infrastructure managers. Obviously, it's directed uh, with railway operations. So everybody's talking and, and everybody's mouse and everybody's talking about drones. And drones uh, can also be used as a sensor for operational uses, use cases, uh, improving safety and uh, for effi uh, effectiveness in operation. Uh, and, and, and that's about uh, more in the next uh, webinar. Okay, thanks a lot, Christian. Uh, very okay. short clo closing remark uh, from my side. First of all, thanks to 
I arise to frequent his great vision and also, of course, from to all speakers, including Frederick and David, for this interesting discussion. The topic is very, very wide, uh, as we can see by the number of questions answered and the one that we are not able to answer. In my view, what we have to focus on are two things that are, let's say, been discussed, but not maybe extensively today, but remain important probably given the, the reaction we, we got from the audience. One is the need of prioritization. Uh, uh, I think we know that there are a number of facets where we can put sensor or we can observe this visual solution. But then uh, we risk to have a control room where there are alarm pops popping up for, for a number of events all the time. Uh, and I think uh, the experience of railway undertaking like Trenitalia is already, let's say, probably able to focus on what, uh, what is more critical or more important. But if we let this in the hands of safety agency, we risk to, to ask for to have sensor everywhere, to monitor everything in any moment in time. And so this uh, need of defining prioritization, maybe UIC can also support to harmonize this can, can be helpful. The other topic is uh, using technology means empowering people with technology capabilities also, not just on the vendor side, but on the client side. So to be used well, especially when we look at data management, as was mentioned by many of you, especially Frederick, how much important it is to elaborate uh, data to use all the, and David says the same, all the information we gather to be reused afterwards to really develop intelligence. This requires also capabilities. So it's not just providing solution, but really accompany the, the people that will use such, such kind of solution and the related data in order to, to become capable uh, of using them. So these are my very short closing remarks. Thanks a lot to everybody again. And Jules, I on, I, I'm handing over to you now. Uh, thank you very much, Paolo. Um, and thank you everyone for uh, this very important debate. Um, and, and I hope, um, you know, the idea is that uh, uh, this debate debate may have saved some lives um, uh, in the future uh, uh, from, you know, um, from, from, from future accidents from happening. Um, uh, so um, I thank you to the speakers and uh, the audience uh, uh, members for joining us. And thank you especially to the um, sponsors, uh, uh, Frequentist and Rail Vision. Um, yes, if, um, uh, so we have, uh, um, as, as Paolo and uh, Christian were talking about, we have the next uh, webinar coming up in, uh, uh, in a few weeks' time, at 21st of November. Um, uh, so a continuation of this debate um, and uh, talking uh, now about um, how so that the incident has happened, how can we restore uh, operations quickly? Um, so we are talking specifically about drones. This is a kind of uh, obviously new uh, technology, uh, and, and in this case used for as a as fast responder uh, technology. Uh, so we have a, a couple more speakers. Uh, we are uh, waiting for confirmation from, including uh, infrastructure manager and an operator. Uh, so we will be um, uh, will be welcoming frequent speaker as well as uh, a drone cloud. Uh, speaker and uh, um, be moderated uh, by uh, um, a professor of uh, condition monitoring who uh, is uh, um, specialist in this area. Um, so I look forward to seeing you all in this uh, next debate uh, as well. Um, just a quick uh, information about our annual event coming up uh, next year in February. This is the 12th edition um, uh, happening in, uh, in Rome. Um, uh, so um, uh, hopefully some of you uh, uh, will join uh, this event um, in, in February. Um, it's it's uh, what we do is a, um, uh, a, a mixture of high level networking between uh, sea level, director level, um, um, uh, rail operator and, and infrastructure manager delegates um, and policy makers and also um, innovative solution providers uh, coming in one place uh, and, um, and supported as uh, always by uh, the International Union Railways, UIC. So I hope you can join this event um, in, in February. So thank you very much for today's uh, debate. Uh, thank you to all the speakers, Frederick Enon, Christian Stimakovic, uh, David Russo, 
um, uh, Shaha Hania, and of course the moderator, Paolo Guglielminetti. Um, thank you to all the audience. Thank you to the sponsors, um, uh, the Frequentes and Rail Vision. And I hope to see you again in the next edition and at our summit in Rome. Thank you everyone and goodbye.